Where was Jesus for the three days in the tomb? Hey everybody, I'm Pastor John and I'm here with Pastor Aaron, who is our Whalen Campus Pastor here at Peace Church. We yep. are getting ready to follow up Easter. We got lots of great questions coming in from yeah, y'all. It was awesome to get to celebrate Easter. By the way, I noticed that I think you've got some red on your face like I have some red on my face. Did it right. occur to you what that might be from? From sunburn? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It just hit me last night when I was getting ready for bed that we uh, we spent you know, most of the day in a greenhouse. And that sun, I, I had like some sunburn going on in my face last night. So. Yeah, absolutely. My daughters actually made fun of me as I woke up this morning. So ask me why my <laughs> cheeks were so red, rosy. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Well, hey, this is uh, That's a Good Question, the show where we get to answer some questions about the Christian faith and about the sermon that was just preached on Sunday at Peace Church. Yep. And of course, this past Sunday was Easter, so we get to follow up Easter, and so we're excited to get to do that. Pastor Ryan couldn't be with us today, but Pastor Ryan and Pastor Aaron both preached the Easter sermon, uh, one at the main campus, one at uh, the greenhouse across the street, and so we're excited to answer some questions. Yeah. So here we go. First question. Why don't we celebrate Easter on a date so it doesn't change every year like Christmas? Yeah, and this is actually a great question, one that I'd never thought of before. Um, you know, as I read it, I, I assumed it's, you know, it's connected in with Passover, right? And so we have Passover, which that changes depending upon um, the year and all of that kind of stuff. And so it's at the tail end of of Passover. And, and so I think that's the main... The main reason, um, again, I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Passover operates on the lunar calendar, I believe, right? right? So we go by the moon and that whole thing, and however that works. <laughs> yep. I don't, I don't know the answers of how that works. Uh, my phone tells me what uh, what the date is, what the time is, how the that stuff works. But yeah, Passover works on the lunar, lunar calendar, and then Easter moves off of that. So that's why it moves every year. I know it'd be nice if it was the same every year. Yeah, it would. And that is exactly what we did with Christmas. We just kind of chose a day. Yeah, right. right. And so, yeah. Yeah, I guess it could. Yeah, could I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Man, that's how it goes. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> All right. So the next question we got several times uh, because you guys preached this past Sunday uh, three proofs for the resurrection. And you and Pastor yeah. Ryan both shared that that list of three actually started out as a list of 10. Yep. Then we're just way down to five, then down to three. Um, so the number one question we got was, what are the other seven? What are the other <laughs> proofs of the resurrection we got? So do you have some of those you can share with us? Yeah. Well, I think one of the cool things, we kind of still worked them in at a much surface level kind of kind of idea. And so the original plan is we are going to go much more in depth on, under some of those specific headings. For instance, one of the the points that that I made, and I, I believe Pastor Ryan did this as well, when we were talking about uh, the tomb being empty, and I made a quick mention of women being uh, the first, or the the first to give the testimony, right? And that the fact that in that day and time and culture, a woman's testimony was not seen as valid evidence. And so that's just kind of an example. We kind of snuck them in there um, just real quick. Um, another one is uh, discrepancies among the gospels, right? So you have the um, synoptic gospels and they all tell the, the story in a little bit different way. And we're, we'll, we'll get into some of that um, here as well. But the fact that there, what appears to be discrepancies among the gospel accounts are not actually discrepancies. It's the way in which different authors communicated or emphasized different portions or used different words or described something differently. Um, for example, one, one of my daughters um, would, would describe me as young, right? And as my wife tells me, I'm pushing 40. And so to me, that doesn't feel too young anymore. But to a lot of our uh, viewers out there, I'm still a baby, you know, in, in their eyes. And so one uh, daughter may describe me as young, while another daughter may point out uh, the, the gray I have in my beard coming on the side that I sure. pluck out, you know. And different so, perspective. Yeah, yeah, different perspective. Both things are true, but you understand them differently. And so that's an example of another one. And then we had, you know, the three that, that we went through 
as well. Um, and so, yeah, it was fun to be able to talk through those and, and discuss those. And I'm sure Pastor Ryan has um, some different takes as well yeah. on those same points. So some of the good news for everybody is that you didn't miss out on them. They just got Correct. worked in in a more yeah. subtle way. They didn't yeah. get their own number, their own uh, talking points, but they got worked in in some way. That's yeah. right. So good. That's awesome. All right, next question. So how did the women plan on getting into the tomb to wash Jesus' body if they knew it was sealed? Great question. When I read yeah. that question, I, I I had to think to myself, wait a minute, that's a, that's a good one. Why did they think they were going to be able to get in? Uh, you want to kick us off? Yeah, well, I think what's so interesting about that is actually in, in Mark 16, and again, this is an example of the different, what appears to be discrepancies among the gospel accounts, right? Um, the women, as they're walking to uh, the tomb, they're actually having that same discussion. Yeah. Like, what are we going to do <laughs> once we get to the yeah. tomb? Like, who's going to open this thing for us? And so um, they were actually wondering that same exact question on their way to the tomb. Do you have any more right. thoughts? Yeah. Well, yeah. The way Mark 16 reads is like, as they're walking up, they say, who will move away the stone for us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they say, well, you know, well good news. It's, it's been rolled away. Mm. So they didn't have an answer to that question themselves. Uh, I guess maybe they hoped that the the guard or whoever was a big muscly guy and maybe could move this thing out of the could way. Could help them out. Um, yeah. But yeah, great question. And I think that's the answer is that they, they didn't know. They weren't sure what was going to yeah. happen. Um, and the good news was the stone was already rolled away and yeah. the tomb was empty. Well, and I think, too, if I remember right, in Matthew's account, um, there's this this discussion that the the chief priests are having, and they're they're it's coming to mind that Jesus said he would um, resurrect, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly if those are the terms, but they were they're worried that the disciples would come and and kind of yeah. do something, right? So they asked for it to be sealed yeah. for three days, and so that's where it's like they're coming at the end of three days. Maybe they. Th- thought it was going to be, or they didn't, weren't sure on the timing, you yeah. know, all of those. And again, that's another example of the discrepancies or the perceived discrepancies among the Gospels as well. Yeah, yeah. So right alongside of that, in the narrative also is the scene where um, we see that when they get into the tomb, that there is uh, the face cloth that is neatly folded up and set mm. uh, aside from the burial clothes. So what's up with that? Why is the face cloth folded and set aside? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I thought that was an incredibly interesting question as well. Um, you know, and I'm not so sure that we really actually know why this is. I think one of the uh, common thoughts is this idea of like, uh, you know, I'm sitting down having a meal and and I have a servant that is actually waiting on me and and. If I if I'm finished, I'm gonna you know clean my beard, get everything out of the beard, and I'm gonna you know wad it up and throw it down, and that will actually signify that that I'm finished, and then he has to come and you know clean up and take care of stuff. But um, you know if if I'm sitting down, I actually fold the napkin, that would indicate to the servant that I was actually going to be returning. And so there's this kind of thought process that maybe that's what Jesus was doing. Um, some of our translations actually translate that word uh, as napkin, mm-hmm. right? And so that that seems to kind of lean towards that understanding. Um, although there's, there's lots of people who say that they didn't have that type of um, interaction with napkins, you know, back in Jesus's time. And so um, they were more like in my house where we don't use napkins. You just use the corner of the shirt. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And so, and so, yeah, but what, what it can mean is, you know, they were also, they were worried about somebody coming and stealing Jesus's body and all that kind of stuff. And um, the fact that the face cloth was folded up, put away, it just entering that space. You're like, well, that's weird. Jesus' body is gone. If somebody came in here and took the body, why would they take time to fold up the face cloth and lay it neatly on, um, you know, where his head was? And so, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I can I can assume that it, it felt different walking into that space with his body gone yeah. and that cloth folded as opposed to everything just kind of scattered around. Sure. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. And I think it adds to as a proof of the resurrection that um, you know, Jesus has to burst his way out of his normal clothes, whatever he was wrapped in. And then, mm. so those just kind of get scattered, but that he would take the 
face cloth, you know, with his hands off of his own yeah. face, sort of fold it up, set it aside. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, whereas a, a thief, somebody stealing the body wouldn't do that. Very true. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. All right, cool. Next question. Uh, why didn't Mary recognize Jesus when she saw him? So, you know, she's crying and she stands up and looks around and she sees somebody and she says, you know, are you the gardener? Tell me where you've laid him. Um, and then Jesus speaks to her and he says, Mary. And then she realizes that it's him. Um, so what's what's the deal? How come Mary doesn't recognize him? Yeah. And again, this is another great question that we're just not certain of. We can speculate, right? Um you know, it, it says they showed up very early. Some, some again, uh, gospel accounts say while it was still dark. So we don't exactly know um, the kind of conditions that all this took place in. Yeah. Um, we know that Mary was was weeping and was crying, right? And then what was even interesting at, at, about this is she's weeping, she's crying, somebody approaches. Um, you know, the tendency is, is to turn away. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you don't want people to see you crying, yeah. um, turn away. And then it, after Jesus is after Jesus says Mary's name, it says that she turned back to him. And so maybe maybe there was something going on there. Um, yeah. I'd, yeah. We have some speculation, but I'm not sure we really know. Well, I think the other aspect is she thinks she expects him to be dead. You know, if, <laughs> that, you know I, that's a good she's one. not looking yeah. for his face. She's not expecting him. Um, and so that would be a, a major shock. Uh, and we yeah. actually have other testimonies later in at, at the very end of the Gospels, like Jesus on the Emmaus Road, when some other people don't recognize Jesus right away. Mm-hmm. Um, we think some of that is probably supernatural, especially on the Emmaus Road, because there's sort of that moment where it's like all of a sudden they yeah. do recognize him. Jesus sort of lifts the veil and they do recognize him. But yeah, yeah I think those are all kind of good reasons that she might not recognize him. All right, next question. Why did Judas betray Jesus? I understand he wanted money for instant gratification, but why would he choose to betray him, and what was his motivation? Hmm. Great question. Good question. Yeah. Great question. Was it just for the money, or was there more to it? Yeah, and as I read this question, it was that motivation uh, aspect to it that I thought was so interesting. What was Judas's motivation? Because we know uh, throughout Jesus' ministry— Judas was was present and did not necessarily care about the ministry of Jesus. And so when we think about the betrayal of Judas, you know, this is the moment we think of often, but this is not the only betrayal that Judas had against Jesus, right? Yeah, there's some other weird moments in the gospel where you can tell uh, Judas is not entirely on board, that yeah. he's, um, his heart's kind of elsewhere. In John 12, 4 through 6, it says, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said this, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag he used to help himself to it, he used to help himself to what was put into it. We see this all throughout. So the question for me is, what is Judas's motivation in following Jesus, mm. right? So it, it's mm. bigger than just this one moment, but it's like, why, why spend this time? Like, what does Judas get out of being connected to this Jesus and his ministry? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Man, that's, that's a put. great question. <laughs> no. I don't know if I have an answer to that off the bat. Um but like you said, I think part of answering the question of why did he betray him is that his heart was not really there the whole time. Um, we have just some, kind of some glimpses, some peeks at that. Um, to go kind of uh, meta perspective also, we could add that one of the reasons is that Scripture prophesies that that's going to happen. Uh, scripture prophesies that Jesus is going to be betrayed for money. Um, yeah. And so Jesus is fulfilling prophecy in that way. Um Great question. We got a special note here in the question that says that this question came from a 10-year-old young lady <laughs> named Zoe. So thanks, Zoe. Excellent question. Yeah. Appreciate it. It's good stuff. Um, any other stuff you want to add to that? Um, I think just to note, and something that I found interesting around this as well, is it talks about Satan actually entering the picture with Judas, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's just another component of this that that makes it all the more interesting. How mm-hmm. does all of this work. Um, 
and I I don't always have the answers. So. Yeah, and I'm having one other thought that <clears throat> when you know we have the scene also that Judas sort of throws down the money and runs away, and that's when he actually ends his own life. Um, and so I think you could think there, well, that means that it wasn't really about the money. And I think there's some maybe truth to that, but also that's kind of him sort of regret regretting at the last minute. So he took yeah. the money, he was excited about the money, but then he regrets it last minute, throws down the money, and then feels so much guilt that he actually ends his own life. So we can see sort of Judas mm. has a ton of ups and downs, a ton of uh, how he feels about this whole thing changes throughout the yeah. story. Cool. All right, next question. Here we go. Did Jesus specifically have to die on a cross by crucifixion? Uh, the writer says, I know we need a savior because of our sin, and so he had to die, but did it have to be on a cross? Good question. So we know in Scripture there's yeah. the prophecy, cursed is he who is hung on a tree, um, but there's multiple ways you could die by hanging on a tree, right? You could actually literally be hung um, hung by the neck. That's that's something yeah. they did uh, at yeah. the time. Um, there's the cross. Yeah. So why the cross? Why not another way of of dying for Jesus? Yeah. Well, and again, I think this is all speculation. We obviously don't sure. yeah. don't know the answer. Yep. I I assume you know the Lord could work this out in any way that that He chose to do that. And and but I I go back to Pastor Ryan's message on Good Friday. Right. Um, where he's talking about this word excrucio, excruciating. And I think as the Roman Empire kind of perfected this kind of torturous way to die, to maximize the pain and maximize the length. Um, and I think as Jesus steps into that space, I think that's just a window into how grievous our sin is or our rebellion is against God. Mm. Um and so that's where my mind goes initially. Like it, it showcases um, how sinful and how rebellious mm. we are. It kind of matches. Wow. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, we talked on Sunday about how the cross is sort of the pinnacle of yeah. technology by which to kill people, right? It's, right. it's the worst uh, way to torture somebody and get them to the end of their life while experiencing the most pain. You drew that out in the sermon. Um, Pastor Ryan drew that out in the sermon. Yeah. So you sort of think, man, and by God's design, he waits sort of to that moment in history when the Romans have developed this awful way of dying because it demonstrates just how bad sin is. Wow. Yeah. Great yeah. point. We also think of um, just the public nature of the cross that he is oh, hung yeah. out and people get to see him. There's not only the pain, but also the shame that's yeah. uh, that's with it, and just people get to witness this awful thing that happens. It's not over quick. It's not over in private. It's public. It's long. Um, yeah, and we've got that moment also when the whole world goes dark, and Jesus experiences not only the physical pain of death and the cross, but also the spiritual pain of God's wrath coming coming upon him. Yeah, um, yeah, great point and great question. Yes, and great question. Awesome. All right, last question. Where was Jesus for the three days in the tomb? So we know on Good Friday, he dies on the cross. We know on Easter Sunday morning, he raises from the yeah. dead. What happens in the time between there? Yeah, well, I think immediately my mind goes to Jesus on the cross, having the conversation with the, the thief, right? Where he tells the thief, you know, today you will be with me in paradise. And yeah. so that's where my mind goes immediately. Yeah, yeah. Jesus makes that promise. He said, today, not, not later, but today I will be with yeah. you in paradise. So... The short answer is we know Jesus was in heaven. Right. Now, that's opposite of what I think many people think, and I can see how they would think otherwise. Some people, some people have thought throughout Christian history that Jesus died and he went to hell and suffered for three days and then rose on Sunday, but that's, that's very much not what happened. Um, and the, mm -hmm. the passage that you cited is probably the most important proof for that. So Jesus suffered hell, God's wrath, on the cross, uh, he didn't That's just right. suffer physically, he also suffered spiritually. His father's wrath, all the wrath of God against all the sin of his people, he yeah. suffered on the cross. Um, and so Jesus, and then when Jesus says, it is finished, hanging on the cross, yeah. he really means it. It's, it is finished, it's over, it's done. He's not saying, I need three more days to suffer, and then it will be done. He says, it is finished, yeah. it's done right now. Um, so Jesus suffers, he dies, and then it's over. Um, yeah. And so... Today I'll be with you in paradise. He's in paradise. He's he's with his father. He's in heaven. Um, 
for those three days before he is physically resurrected. Mm-hmm. Um, one other passage that we could think about is in 1 Peter 3, there's a very um, kind of tough to understand passage that alludes to the idea that Jesus preaches the good news to uh, the dead, those in prison. And so some people have speculated, well, maybe Jesus took a short trip down to uh, Hades and uh, preached some kind of message that, hey, I've won, I'm victorious, and yeah. then and then ascended to the Father. So that's maybe possible. Um, well, and even in, in that case, it's he's going down in power, right? Yes, so yeah. he's, he's not going to suffer further for a further justification, right? right exactly. Um, he's going down to proclaim yeah. the good news if, you know, that's what. Right. It's if that's about. what that passage means. Yeah. And either way, it's not him going down to suffer. He's going right. down in victory. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Awesome questions, everybody. I yeah. hope you had an awesome Easter. Hope you have a great rest of this week. And also know that you can watch this uh, on YouTube, Facebook, but also this is a podcast. So if you want to listen to this in the car while you're at work or something like that, uh, put it in your ears and listen. You can also find this uh, wherever you get podcasts from. Have a great week, everybody. Mm-hmm.